We're going to finish up with the very last part of the Java intro. And the coverage we're going to uh, pick up with here has to do with something called Java collections, which is an important part of Java. And a uh, very powerful feature will help to make your life a lot easier once you understand how to use the things we're going to talk about. So the Java collection framework is essentially a, a unified architecture for representing and manipulating collections. As you can see, there's a lot of pieces to it. <clears throat> What's a collection? A collection is basically an object that represents a group of objects, or sub-objects is probably a better term, uh, because it collects or contains those objects internal to itself. So a good example would be an array list. You can see Java has an array list. And uh, an array list is basically a, uh, an array, or a list as we'll see here, of elements. And each element in this particular case is whatever it's been parameterized with. So just like your second programming assignment, the one that has the, the generic interface to it, so too do the collections have generic interfaces. So they're collections of type E, where E is an element, or type T, where T is a type, whatever. And so here's an example where we have an array list of points. And you can see that we have <coughs> some number of points in there. And each of the points themselves is actually a reference to another object. So the thing to remember about Java collections is that they work on user-defined types, not built-in types. And they have references to those objects, which are stored inside the collection. So that means that there's typically sort of two levels. You have to create the collection, and then you have to go ahead and allocate the elements and store them into the collection via various methods. And we'll talk about some of those things. Collections can be manipulated and accessed in a way that's independent of their implementation. And what this really means is that you can work with these things via their interfaces. If you recall, remember Java has interfaces, which are just ways of explaining what the methods are that can be used to either update or uh, access various elements in, in something. In this case, it's a collection. And so here's an example where we have a list interface, which has methods like add and remove and so on. And then we can have different implementations of the list interface. We can have an array list. We can have a linked list and so on. Uh, not surprisingly, well, what do people think? What, what, what do you think would be the difference between an array list implementation of the list interface versus, say, a linked list? implementation of a list interface. Yeah? Right. So basically, the array list stores the elements contiguously, whereas the linked version connects them together by next and prev fields. So those would be the main implementation differences. But from the way that you work with these things, the operations that they provide, they're going to provide list operation interfaces. And there's, there's a whole pile of other stuff. We're, we'll talk very briefly about some of this. Uh, there are many, many interfaces that are part of the Java collection framework. Here are some of them. So you can see things like uh, set, queue, deck. Those are some of the core ones. There's also things that are um, interfaces like blocking interfaces that are used for concurrent operations and so on and so forth. And then there's also a bunch of map interfaces as well. And uh, so these are some of the, the core interfaces that get used as part of Java. There are other ones, but these are some of the, the key ones. And then there's all these classes that implement them. So here's an example of some of the classes. So if you had the list interface, as you can see up there, then we've got a resizable array called an array list and a link list called a link list. Those are some of the implementations of the list interface. Um, something else we'll see in a second, map, very common. There's a map interface. And there's a hash map, and a tree map, and a linked hash map, and all this kind of good stuff. So this allows you to be able to mix and match different implementations with different properties. Now, why is it relevant? Why is it the case that something like Java collection frameworks would have different implementations of the same interface? Why would you need to have an array interface versus a linked interface? Why, why isn't one of them sufficient? Anybody want to make a guess? Right, good. So if you guys remember 201, you probably studied uh, asymptotic time complexity, and you talked about insert and remove and find and all the operations you'd have on an abstract data type like a, 
a list or a set or a map or a hash table or a queue or whatnot. And so different implementations have different properties. For example, uh, what's, a, what's a nice property about an array implementation of a list? What might be something good about it? Random access. You can have random access. Yeah, that's good. Um, well, if they're not sorted, they take linear time to search, but... <laughs> so adding and removing elements to the end is very fast. Yeah, that's good. If it's sorted, right? So if, if the array is sorted, then it's, it's fast, yeah. Is it stored in contiguous memory useful? Yes. So the fact it's stored in contiguous memory means that you don't have to keep track of any other fields like next and prev, which take up extra space. Oh, Java has pointers, sure. Every, everything in Java, every time you say new, you know, blah, blah, new, foo, that, that's a, it's called a reference in Java, but it's a pointer. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, what Java doesn't have is they don't have dynamic memory allocation uh, and deallocation. The, uh, the, they, they have memory allocation, obviously, but uh, they don't have explicit deallocation. It has garbage collection instead. Um, so... So those are some th good things about arrays. What are some things that, that linked lists have in their favor? Why would you want to choose a linked list? I'm sorry? Right, so growing and shrinking doesn't require copying all the elements. You'll actually find that with one of the new um, methods we added in assignment two. We'll talk about it in a second. Uh, we added a remove method for assignment two. So before, your array just had like you know get and set. Now you have a remove. And when you remove an item from an array, you basically copy everything over top of it. Everything gets shifted down by one. So moving something, removing something from a uh, contiguous data structure is more expensive because you have to shift the memory down. Yeah, that's very good. Any? Yes. Yeah, so in Java, the collections hold references to other objects. Right, the ac actual objects which were allocated by new and by new uh, would come from wherever they come from. Yeah. Was there going to be anybody else want to throw in something else good for uh, linked list? Yeah. Does removing an element also decrease the size? Yes, if, remo if you remove an element, it also decreases the size by one. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. You can add an element yes, so adding things, adding things in between, removing things in between. Uh, that's much more efficient for linked lists because they don't have to, uh, <coughs> you don't have to shovel a lot of stuff around, you just rearrange the pointers. It's also worth noting, linked link lists may not be the right example, but um, uh, stack is probably a good example. So with a stack, you only have as many elements as you've actually pushed with a linked list implementation. Whereas with an implementation that uses an array, there may be a big chunk of memory that has not been used yet, but is actually allocated. So those things may be, be bigger than you want. So anyway, the point is that they're trade-offs. And, and the, the answer to the question, why are there different impl implementations, is because one size doesn't fit all in this world. So not surprisingly, the Java collections framework uses inheritance and dynamic uh, binding very heavily. This is one of the main differences between Java and C++. So C++ and its standard template library absolutely does not use inheritance and dynamic binding at all, at least not in any meaningful way. Uh, there's a little tiny thing with exception inheritance, but that's not even worth talking about. So C++, everything is statically bound. Everything is optimized at compile and link time. Conversely, with Java, everything is dynamically bound. Everything uses inheritance and dynamic binding. And so there's all kinds of interesting subtle trade-offs there and pros and cons, but the features are more or less the same. All right, so there's a couple benefits. One benefit with, with uh, having this collections framework is it reduces your programming effort. You still have to learn all these things, of course, but you don't have to write them. And that's what we would call a labor-saving device, right, like a, like a Roomba. You don't have to push the vacuum cleaner around. You let your little Roomba robot go around and clean your room. I was in, uh, I was in India a couple years ago doing some work for a company called Qualcomm, and we went on a tour while we were there, which was quite exciting. And we went to a place, it was a really cool palace, and we were walking around doing some sightseeing, and on the grass, uh, on a big, huge, big, huge lawn, like easily the size of a football field, 
there are a bunch of women in their 60s or 70s in their beautiful dresses, their saris, cutting grass with scissors. And I said, wow, to our tour guide. I said, that's amazing. That seems like it would take a long time to cut a grass the size of a football field with scissors. And he said, it will. Um, he said, in India, we have to give everybody a job if they want a job. And so their job is to cut the grass with scissors. And I suddenly realized in a, com in a country with a billion people, labor-saving device is not always a win, right? <laughs> so in the case of Java collections, it's a win, right? You, d you don't necessarily want to hire lots of people to write you know, collections for you, right? That's not necessarily a good use of their time. But um, in other contexts, it's not always a win. The other thing you get with, with a Java container collection framework is increased performance relative to what you would probably do yourself unless you had gotten a PhD in advanced data structures and algorithms. So if you were to take a peek at the implementation of some of the data structures that are lurking under the hood in Java collections, which you can do, by the way, because all the source code's open, uh, you'll be, your mind will explode. Some of the stuff is really, really, really cool and very sophisticated and uses absolutely the most cutting edge algorithms and data structures, uh, especially with respect to things like multi-core. So you don't want to have to know how to do that, bottom line. You want someone else to figure that out. It also enables interoperability among unrelated APIs. In other words, you may have programs that are written with pieces by different people. Different people write different parts of the program, and they may not all sit down and coordinate all the interfaces. But oftentimes, they will agree to pass things back and forth in standard ways using Java collections, like sets or maps or array lists or whatever. And so that makes it easier for things to work together because they're using shared common data structures and their algorithms. Um, likewise, when you're, when you're designing a new, if you want to design a new data structure for some strange, odd, odd reason, very few people design data structures anymore, but if they do, they typically fit them within the context of the existing interfaces and class hierarchies in something like the Java Collections Framework. So there's fewer surprises. You don't have to go out and reinvent a bunch of things. You already know what it is you need to do. And of course, the other big thing is just fostering software reuse. So not having to rewrite code, especially code that's kind of infrastructure plumbing is, is usually a win. So let's take a look at a couple of examples and I'll walk through a couple of use cases. These are examples are chosen because they're very common. You'll undoubtedly run into examples in, later in the class where you have to use this stuff. One common data structure is an array list which implements list. So here's a case where we're actually making an array list. In fact, just because we're cool, we can program that like this, if we so desire. So you'll see here, this is a very common technique that's used a lot in Java. Um, we define ourselves a list of strings, and then we go ahead and make ourselves a new array list. And because array list implements a list, we can use an array list where we're uh, defining a list. We could also say, uh, list string my list equal new linked list instead of array list and it would work the same way. So as you can see here we go ahead and we add a bunch of string literals here. There's a sort of a magic implicit conversion that turns these into objects and they get added there so we now have three elements here and um, whoops Let's fix this Oh, come on. There we go. Um, and so once we've stored three elements here, then we can go ahead and get ourselves the item in offset zero right there. You do a get. That gives us back a string. And notice because this is parameterized by string, uh, we don't have to put a typecast here. This, this thing knows it's returning a string. We can get a string back. So we can get the item, we can remove the item. If we remove this item, it'll go ahead and zap the first one. It'll copy the other ones down, uh, the references down over top of it, and so on and so forth. That's basically how things work. It's kind of like a dynamically resizable Java array. And the other very common, very popular type of collection is a hash map. So uh, an array, uh, array list, or a list, or a linked list is very simple. It does things based on position, like location one, location zero, location three, et cetera. Um, but with a hash map, you basically do it based on key. So you can see over here, we say we have a hash map. 
which maps strings to foos, whatever foos are. And we can make ourselves a bunch of foos. And then we can go ahead and we can put these foo objects, f1, f2, f3, into the map at these named keys, 1, 2, 3. And of course, they could be anything. We just chose those names. And then down here, we can come down and look something up, get back the item that goes along with it, um, and so on and so forth. So those are some simple examples of how to use some of the containers in, in Java. Any questions about the Java Collections framework? You'll get more chance to play around with that later. Way cooler than, than containers are concurrent conta uh, containers or concurrent collections. So we'll talk more about those later in the course. They're basically collections that can work in a multi-threaded environment where there may be multiple threads at a time trying to put and get elements into the container, into the collection. And as you'll see, uh, if we have a chance to talk about any of this stuff later, way cool algorithms, very, very clever, a lot of use of so-called lock-free synchronization where it doesn't actually cause the program to wait. They use uh, real clever low-level hardware instructions like compare and swap instructions that are used on multi-core platforms and so on. So there's lots of cool collections that deal with concurrency. We're not going to cover them for a while, but uh, there's going to be a lot more of this covered in CS282, which is a course you might want to think about taking after this one. All right, last topic here. It's a real fun one because it's easy and it's also good to know. Some of the stuff here is very late breaking in Java. There's a bunch of different ways to iterate through collections in Java. There are four ways to do it, and we'll go through them one at a time. The first way to do it, which was one we show here, uses just a conventional loop. This is what you're probably most accustomed to based on what you've done in 101 and 201 so far. So you take a look here. We make ourselves a list of strings. We go ahead and add some elements. And then for i equals 0, i less than the size of the, the array list, we go ahead and print out each element one at a time. So that's pretty canonical, but it's kind of boring. No, no self-respecting. Java programmer would write code like that anymore. It's like uh, you know, wearing the wrong type of suit or the wrong type of you know, uh, tie or something like that. It's just not, not hip to do it that way. A more effective way, which is probably the coolest way or easiest way to do it, something you should get in the habit of doing, is to use the so-called for each loop. And what this does is it basically makes it possible to short circuit the syntax of this so that you can create a, yourself a collection, add a bunch of elements to it, and then you can say, basically, for each string in my strings, go ahead and print out the value of that string. So what you're doing here is you're defining a string, which is a variable, of type string, which is the type that my strings is, which is a string from the array list strings, and then it goes through and it, it allows you to access them one at a time. So much cleaner syntactic sugar, perhaps, but it's just a nicer way of writing the code. Very clean and concise. Probably the way to write it unless you uh, are really into Java 8, as we'll see here in a second. Another thing you could do is you can use the, the iterable interface, which uses iterators. And uh, in that case, you would go ahead and say mystrings.iterator. You get an iterator back. And while there's anything left in the iterator, you'll go ahead and print out the next item. This will actually figure in prominently for programming assignment number two, because everybody has to write iterators for programming assignment number two. By the way, if you're trying to figure out what programming assignment number two is, make sure you go back and watch the video that I posted that Professor Adi gave, because he talks a lot about the things you need to understand in order to make that work. This is very pattern-oriented, but it's kind of verbose. I would rather write code like this than I would write code like that. And then the fourth and final way, which is just too cool for its own good, is to use the new for each method, which is part of Java 8 streams. And this allows you to do all kinds of crazy things. But by itself, what I'm showing you here is only marginally an improvement. Um, in fact, it's syntactically more complicated, just like Jonathan. Um, but the way this gets worked into the long term is much cooler. So what this is doing is basically saying, take the my strings array list, convert it into a stream with the dot stream operator. And then for every element in the stream, which are strings, for each of them, go ahead and print out each of those things as a string. 
And if it does look a little mysterious, it, it, does, it does indeed look mysterious. And so we'll have to talk about that later in the course when we talk more about lambda expressions and so on. Um, I wouldn't expect anybody to write code like that unless they've been studying Java 8. Yes, sir? For all the for each uh, ways of doing the loop, is there a way to get index? You mean like for this thing? Yeah. No, you'd have to keep a counter. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, good question. All right, any questions? So this is very powerful, but it requires knowledge of lambda expressions and streams. It's the way the world is going to, for better or worse, but um, for right now, it's overkill. Yeah? What do you mean by powerful? What's that? What do you mean by powerful? Uh, it's powerful because it allows you to use functional programming abstractions in Java, which has heretofore been in mostly an object-oriented language. And that allows you to be able to do very interesting compositional operations where you string together a series of transformations called mappings or maps um, to be able to transform data from one state to another or from one phase to another. If that doesn't make any sense, don't worry about it. We'll cover it later. Yeah? So you said you can't, you can't access a specific uh, member from an array list. So does that mean you can't? Oh, sure. You can, you can access. So I mean, here's the easiest way to do it, right? You just say, uh, my strings is an array list. So my strings dot get sub i. You get, his question, however, I think was, <coughs> if you use the for each version, which is that version, is there some implicit counter that's being incremented that you can get access to? And the answer is no. It's called you know, declaring a variable called i and incrementing it one at a time, which is what you would do with this version. So the reason that you would use this is if you didn't need to have a counter. Yeah? Are there performance differences between all these? Yes. Um, and of course, it all depends on a bunch of different factors having to do with the quality of the compiler that you're dealing with. Um, oddly enough, some of the performance overhead actually comes not so much from time, but from power usage. So uh, on platforms where battery, where, where power is essential, like a battery-powered mobile device, um, using different looping constructs has a big impact on power consumption. And so the, there's no easy way to tell you which one to use because it's completely an implementation detail. But yes, there, there are definitely differences, and different versions of different compilers will optimize them in different ways. As a general rule of thumb, um, you would think that this way would be the fastest because the compiler has the most leeway to optimize the heck out of it under the hood. Oddly enough, that's not always the case. This is probably a more efficient way of doing things just because of the way most compilers work. Um, iterators are going to be a little bit more expensive. And streams are definitely more complicated and have more overhead. But they're also, you know, using streams is about macro level optimization, not micro level optimization. Oh, yeah. You, there's nothing wrong with using a conventional for loop. I mean, just like there's nothing wrong with wearing a double-breasted suit, you know. I mean, people will snicker at you as you walk down the street, but there's nothing wrong with it, okay? <laughs> no, it's, it's fine. It's just a, um, a good thing to... You, you'll, you'll develop your own style very quickly, and my typical style is I want to write as little code as possible to get the job done, and the more code I write, first of all, I have to type it out, and then I have to go back and remember why did it look like that. And so you'll typically probably find yourself gravitating to this form whenever you possibly can. Like separate, separate, uh, well, that's, that's the old school way of doing things, which is you know, more verbose than this way, right? This is more concise. So I think most people tend to like the for each model just because it's more succinct, more parsimonious. How come there isn't one How come there isn't one smartphone that everybody uses? How come there isn't one automobile that everybody drives? How come there's not one political socioeconomic economic system, right? How come we don't all live in the same state, right? It's about freedom of choice, man. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Yeah, that's 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 the uh, life in the competitive capitalistic <laughs> ecosystem we live in. People come up with new ideas, better ideas, and stuff like that. Actually, a, a better answer even than that is um, because people get smarter over time. And so there may be version one of a compiler, and it may have been released 
to uh, get the thing out the door. But then by the time release two, release three, release five, you know, think of how long Java's been around. Java started out in the early 90s, so it's, it's um, you know, over 20 years old now. So at this point, I hope people will have figured out how to improve the way that the compilers work. So the reason there's not one compiler is because people keep coming up with new ways to implement it and new ways to optimize it. So even if there was only one compiler, even if there was the, the five-year plan for compilers, right, where you have a central committee that gets together and decides you know, what your compiler features will be, every five years or so they would come up with new improvements and um, they would get better and faster and, and smaller and all the other good things we want to have. So it's, it's because things keep improving. So when a feature comes out, it may or may not be implemented super optimally because the, the job is just to get the thing out the door. Um, but over time, people get smarter. Other questions? Yeah? Less code versus more readable code. Whose who's definition of readable? Oh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> um, there definitely is a trade-off between inscrutably obscure, you know, funny characters versus things that are understandable. But um, as a rule of thumb, something seems less readable because you're not familiar with it. And once you understand the idiom, then it, it looks what's, what may have appeared, it looked like it was maybe a little obscure. Once you're familiar with it, boom, you know, it, it's, it's old hat. You don't even stop to think about it anymore, which is, is really the way it should be.